Our next speaker is uh, our host, uh, Holger Schumann. Holger is chair of the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster, uh, and I think he's the seventh or eighth in a distinguished line of uh, leaders of that uh, wonderful department. Uh, he did his training uh, in medicine, uh, epidemiology, and biostatistics, uh, and preventive uh, uh, medicine uh, as well, and has authored over 300 uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications, many of them on uh, guidelines, methodology, and uh, systematic reviews. He's co-chair of the GRADE uh, Working Group and a member of the Guidelines International Network uh, Board of uh, Trustees and the Advisory Committee of the Health Research uh, at the World Health uh, Organization. He's been a member of and chaired various guideline uh, enterprises at uh, WHO, ACP, ACCP, and the American Thoracic Society. Or ATS, is that American Trial Society? Uh, showing my, my background. Uh, he's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Guidelines International Network and elected, an elected member of the Cochrane Collaboration Steering Group and co-director of the WHO Collaborating Seven, uh, Center for uh, Informed Evidence. Uh, his topic this afternoon, not surprisingly, is GRADE's framework uh, for increasing confidence in results of observational studies, Holger. Well, I will um, thank a number of people, um, foremost um, Dave. Um, I uh, described my relation with Dave yesterday morning, so I won't repeat that. Um, and I will thank um, those who invited me. <laughs> um, um, you will see in a, in a minute um, how I got to give this presentation uh, um, for allowing me to speak. So I'm supposed to speak about GRADE's framework for increasing the confidence in observational studies or non-randomized study evidence. Um, there is a little bit of a story to that. Um, we thought that we would have made a little bit more progress um, at this point um, to report on some new things uh, and until um, the Cochrane collaboration um, um, in an effort that Dave Henry already described um, started to look more carefully at non-randomized um, studies and the assessment of risk of bias. John Vandenbroek is inv involved in that as well. Um, and um, um, I think it is a little bit of a game changer. So I will just say that um, uh, I will prese present my own views today um, not those of the great working group, um, which may be considerably different. Um, I have no financial conflicts of interest, and um, uh, um, I would also disclose that I had the opportunity to listen, obviously, to presentations of others um, and did change a little bit of what I plan to say. Uh, um, so I'll start by saying why me? Um, it's very simple. Um, there would have been um, um, one person who I would have liked um, to speak about increasing the confidence in estimates of observational studies, Paul Glassieu. Um, but Paul unfortunately had commitments and lives in Australia and couldn't uh, um, make it possibly on time. Um, Andy Oxman um, took the more difficult task, I think, of chairing the first day. Um, Gordon um, uh, had a uh, commitment of attending a wedding at the West Coast and inviting the entire great working group um, was too expensive. Um, um, so it's me, um, over the next 20 minutes, I will just very briefly describe the background um, um, to the great working group and speak about um, the approach to assessing confidence in estimates or quality of evidence and then I will try to answer the question if RCTs, RCTs are really queen, I would say, um, for gender balance as opposed to king, as we heard yesterday. Um, I, will ref I will relate to the flat um, hierarchy that was introduced yesterday by um, Ralph Horwitz, and I think uh, rightly so, um, and then supported by others. And I will try to make a case why I think hierarchies are still helpful um, at the end. Um, uh, and then finally, I will speak about what increases our confidence in um, observational study or non-randomized study evidence. I will refer uh, generally to a body of evidence, so a summary or a synthesis of available studies for a given topic or a given um, healthcare question. In terms of terminology, 
I will use the terms quality of evidence, levels of evidence, certainty of evidence, confidence in effect estimates, and certainty in estimates interchangeably at this point, and there's a good reason um, um, that um, um, I could, I could uh, describe in the discussion but will not in, uh, in this presentation. So in terms of grade, just quickly, um, it's an international uh, group of contributors with different backgrounds, really a diversity of backgrounds, um, uh, initiated by, uh, once again, Andy Oxman. Um, and we've been meeting over the past 13 years to develop a unifying, transparent, and sensible system for grading the quality of evidence, in other words, uh, um, assessing confidence in estimates, and developing recommendations, which um, um, is a quite, uh, is a related but um, uh, uh, um, a somewhat separate process. Uh, over 75 or exactly 75 organizations have adopted this um, approach or use GRADE. Um, GRADE or the GRADE Working Group is not a formal organization and I think that's a benefit. So I will um, show you three examples of um, guidelines or systematic reviews, systematic reviews that inform guidelines that I've been involved with either more recently or a bit more in the past. Um, um, this is a very recent example. It um, uh, um, relates to the question whether or not or um, um, in patients with multidrug resistant tuberculosis, what is the impact of adding bedaquiline, a new antibiotic, um, to a background regimen of what is presumed to be an efficacious regimen for treating multi-drug resistant um, tuberculosis. And I'm going to show you this very first example. Um, FDA will very much be able to relate to that example. Um, um, it's an example that was, or a um, drug that the World Health Organization felt um, um, should be evaluated, in particular for formulating guidance. Um, and um, um, in that effort, using um, data that were compiled by the Federal Drug um, Administration, um, uh, by FDA, sorry, uh, um, um, and um, um, then delivered to WHO, um, uh, um, um, based on these um, data, a summary of the data was put together, one of these typical great evidence profiles um, that um, I will uh, um, um, just show you some highlights of. So, there were different outcomes evaluated. One of the primary outcomes or critical outcomes to um, see whether or not this drug uh, um, has a beneficial effect um, was to look at cure. And that is cure um, after 120 weeks um, of, um, uh, um, of follow-up. Uh, um, this data was based on one, what was called phase two randomized controlled trials. There were 59 events in 132 patients at um, 120 weeks. Um, the relative risk for cure, statistically significant, was 1.81. Um, and um, there were 26, if you uh, transferred it to absolute effects, 26 more deaths per 100 uh, um, um, patients. Another outcome that was of relevance was mortality. Uh, we talked yesterday about the terminology severe adverse events with mortality is a bit difficult in this particular case because um, patients with multidrug res res resistant TB also die and you might cure their, their um, TB um, and they don't die for that reason, but it could also be a serious adverse event. In fact, um, there were um, 10 events in 160 patients, so you see that there's slight difference in the denominator here, um, and the relative risk for death was 9.23. So a ninefold increase based on very small numbers um, um, of death, uh, um, related, um, um, translating to about um, uh, a 10% absolute risk increase or 10 per 100 more patients who died. I'm gonna show you a second example from um, the antithrombotic guidelines uh, um, that um, the um, American College of Chest Physicians puts out. And this example is well known to many um, of you in the room. Um, in patients with atherosclerosis, um, um, that could be of the brain, the heart, or the limbs, what is the impact of um, clopidogrel compared to aspirin as a blood thinner? Um, once again, um, an evidence profile was put together. There was one RCT. Um, there were um, over 1,000 events in 15,000 patients, over 15,000 patients. Relative risk was 0 0.99, so no difference for death. Uh, um, with confidence intervals that are shown here, translating into absolute effects um, um, ranging from about um, 17 fewer to 17 more death. 
And I'm going to show you a third example. Also, that example is based on a single randomized trial. In patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, what is the impact of um, um, azathioprine, steroids, and, and, ac uh, and acetylcysteine? Also, that is from a guideline. Evidence profile was put together. Um, uh, um, one randomized controlled trial, as I said, um, several outcomes of relevance, mortality being one of them. Um, my f um, uh, um, this showing basically the evaluation of what we think the quality of this trial was, um, uh, and here showing results. The first question that I have for you um, is, um, um, uh, is anybody in the room aware of what the comparator in this particular intervention was? Three drugs, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Any respirologist in the room? Nobody knows. Okay. Um, uh, I didn't know really until I started um, um, this work. The comparator here was um, corticosteroids and athothioprine. So um, a background regimen, the comparator once again, um, was some two drugs that are both um, uh, um, immunocompromising drugs and acetylcysteine as an add-on was compared in, in, as a placebo. Um, interestingly enough, um, corticosteroids and athothioprine had never been shown to be efficacious. In fact, um, there was, no, there was no, ben, um, no indication of benefit. So that um, in this particular trial, uh, in this particular example, again, one trial, there was the wrong comparator, um, which would make most of us um, um, a bit worried. In fact, they showed that those who received acetylcysteine had, a, had, had no difference in mortality, but a slightly better um, respiratory function or pulmonary function which by many was suspected to be an effect of decreasing toxicity of these um, two toxic drugs. Um, there were imprecise results related to um, that particular outcome. So my big question for you is, um, having looked at these three examples, if I were to ask you whether or not um, um, you are certain in these estimates of effect um, on, for instance, a scale from zero to 100, um, um, and whether you had any differences in terms of, or whether you would evaluate this body of evidence differently. I guess most people would say these are all randomized controlled trials, but they all, have be they, they all are somewhat different if we think about the sample size, if we think about indirect comparison, um, just on the base of these three examples. And there's another important point, and, is, uh, and that is um, that these are single trials and that um, they provide very different evidence. One trial with 15,000 patients, another trial with 132 patients. So it is very likely, although I'm not going to ask you, that you would say um, this provides me with difference certainty in the estimates of effect. And the big question is where's our starting point? Um, um, and it's a very much the underlying theme of today. Is the starting point somewhere at the top or somewhere at the bottom? We heard yesterday about Bradford Hill, and if we had taken the Bradford Hill approach, we would say, we start with 0% certainty. We are looking for factors that, are, that uh, make us more confident that there are, in fact, causal effects, that there is an association um, um, in order to increase our confidence. Um, and that would have been very reasonable. Um, Bradford Hill's criteria were um, um, very well thought out, but things that Bradford Hill did know about, such as publication bias, or that were known at the time, are not considered, and we just heard about um, publication bias in animal research uh, um, and, and how it can play out. Um, obviously, the same is true, although the direction is possibly different in um, 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 drug trials in humans. So um, it was probably insufficient. Uh, um, what I'm getting at is um, that if we think about these randomized trials, and I'm uh, specifically not trying to dismiss observational studies here, if we think about um, randomized controlled trials, um, um, they can be done in very different ways. And I would therefore um, agree um, that research designs are flat um, and not hierarchical, as was said yesterday. But I would say that the certainty in a body of evidence, sometimes from a single trial, um, needs to be assessed and expressed. And in other words, these levels of evidence that um, um, Dave very much worked on um, um, nearly 40 years ago um, and has influenced this, this field, that these levels of evidence have a role. And um, the big question is, is that really possible? So who of you in the room thinks that this is possible? We can say that, there is, that research designs 
um, uh, um, as was said, said yesterday, this is literally a quote, um, are flat, they are not hierarchical, um, but yet um, we should express the certainty, of the certainty in the estimates um, um, using hierarchies. Who agrees with that? It's only about one third. Who doesn't agree with that? Okay, there are um, about, I would say, about five to 10% um, who don't agree, 30, 40% who agree, and the others hopefully at the end um, will agree with me. Um, hopefully. Uh, um, so um, in um, um, grade, uh, we have typically said that randomized controlled trials um, start as high quality evidence in four categories. Observational studies start as low or two plus um, quality evidence. And that there are five factors that apply to both design types um, uh, um, that lower your confidence or the certainty. Um, risk of bias criteria applied appropriately, different risk of bias criteria to randomized controlled trials um, um, from non-randomized studies or observational studies um, when there is inconsistency of the results or unexplained heterogeneity, when there is indirectness having to do with applicability, transferability, um, generalizability, and external validity, all things that were referred to earlier, um, 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 imprecision, um, uh, um, I gave you a couple of examples here and publication bias and that there are three factors that can increase the certainty when there are very large effects that I will describe further, um, opposing plausible residual bias or confounding and dose response gradients. The problem is, um, and that is in particular the, uh, the part where I'm speaking for myself, the problem is um, that um, we are slightly confusing people using this system by evaluating risk of bias twice. We first look at um, whether or not there are randomized trials, so lack of randomization would be obviously a risk of bias criterion, um, and then we look again by study type. Conceptually, that um, obviously needs to be separated, but it is confusing to people um, um, taking that approach. So I'll come back to that particular slide um, and we'll say that research design really refers to methods um, and the certainty of the evidence refers to how studies were actually executed, how bias was avoided, and what the actual results are. So that I do not think that we should do away with um, 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 evidence hierarchies, although hierarchies are not a good term um, necessarily, but it expresses what we mean, but that we um, should be looking very carefully um, uh, um, by having evidence um, possibly start at the top and look at factors that lower our confidence and that these factors um, um, should be applied to both randomized controlled trials that may either that may start as, um, um, with a high degree of certainty but based on what we evaluate may end up somewhere down there such as in at least one of the examples that I showed. Um, um, and the same is probably true for observational studies um, that um, we should look at these factors that I just described and see whether or not um, uh, where um, this body of evidence from observational studies is placed. The big question is, do we need a common metric um, for determining our, our certainty in the um, effect estimates? Um, I would say it's very important to have that, uh, um, in particular as we think about comparisons between different interventions for different problems um, prioritization based on burden of disease or cost for the healthcare system and so on um, really do need um, um, independent comparators. Um, and um, um, people have used, um, have started to use the, um, um, this type of slide um, repeatedly. So the question is, um, can you use GRAY to do all of this? I um, um, will put forward that we can because when we think about observational studies, we've thought carefully about these factors. Um, you are all familiar with this particular example and I um, show it over and over again and that is uh, um, if parachutes um, reduce the risk of death um, when you jump from an airplane, no randomized controlled trials. We all know this example. We also know that it was a fun example. Um, I actually, some time ago when I prepared for a presentation, others have done that as well, I think, um, looked for the evidence. And there is actually pretty good evidence that um, parachutes do in fact reduce the risk of death. Um, there is registries that are better than any healthcare registries or health um, pr um, healthcare provision registries that show that there's a 99.9% .9 relative risk reduction. So the big question is why are we so, why do we believe in this type of evidence? 
um, and um, um, I would say it relates to the magnitude of the effect and um, um, therefore if we were to place um, a level of certainty on this we would be very very um, confident that there is some effect um, and we would look at whether there is risk of bias in this particular um, evidence that we have um, there and whether there's inconsistency and so on but it's really the magnitude of the effect the repeatability of the um, exams that make us confident um, um, I would have not jumped from an airplane just on the basics of physics alone. So large effects um, pretty much relate to the following. Everyone used to do badly. Almost everyone does well um, after an intervention. Um, um, Paul Gashu has very much, uh, very nicely laid this out, um, provided examples, insulin and diabetes being one um, uh, paradigmatic example for um, when um, we increase our confidence in estimates of effect. Um, a second example relates to when we have clear dose um, response relations. So for um, a good example here is that um, higher doses of anticoagulants, even if they are evaluated in observational studies um, and can be measured in terms of how, if, uh, um, how much they thin the blood, um, increase the risk of bleeding. And then a third example that we use frequently has to do with um, whether or not all plausible residual confounding, and we've talked a lot about residual confounding or bias, may be working to reduce the demonstrated effect. Um, or suggest an effect if none was observed. And a good example here is, um, I will just describe the one example that I think is even better than what I show here. It's just politically more charged. That's why I don't um, have it on the slide. Um, and that relates to um, MMR vaccination and um, uh, um, the suspicion that this would cause autism has caused a lot of um, uh, um, concerns in the, in the immunization community as well as amongst parents. Um, this would have led um, very much to over-reporting of adverse effects such as, um, um, such as autism um, when um, uh, MMR vaccine was administered. Um, despite the uh, concern and likely over-reporting of adverse effects when people actually went out and looked at large um, observational studies, there was no increase in um, um, autism. Um, and that is then further corroborated by the fact that the original um, um, data that were published in the Lancet had to be withdrawn because of um, uh, false reporting of fraud, uh, um, in, in, uh, fraud essentially. So um, um, I'm coming to um, um, I'm close with the last uh, um, a few slides here. And um, what I'm um, uh, proposing is that uh, our confidence in observational research is primarily um, influenced by what we observe. In other words, based on the grade scheme here at least, um, uh, our confidence in, in estimates from observational studies are increased when uh, we actually look at the results, such as um, um, observing large effects, clearly finding those response relations, um, and observing results that are unlikely to be explained by residual plausible opposing bias or confounding. Um, so, that um, um, currently, uh, related to that, currently in grade, we um, assess the risk of bias um, twice. Uh, um, we distinguish between randomized controlled trials and observational studies, do that within each study design and separately. And with the um, event or with the emergence of better tools for assessing risk of bias in non-randomized studies, the question is whether that is sti still necessary. Um, so, for instance, in that new tool that is proposed by the Cochrane Collaboration in collaboration with many other people, um, um, bias due to confounding um, would be evaluated um, in comparison to randomized um, and how it could be done in randomized controlled trials. It is done by outcome, um, shown here by O1, um, uh, O2, and O3. Um, so you might have different risk of bias for different outcomes, just as we do it in GRADE, and I presume that most of you are familiar with GRADE. You would assess the risk of bias um, related to different outcomes. So for instance, bias due to confounding, selection of participants into the study. And it is very clear that randomization will protect against that bias and confounding, um, and will protect against some of these other factors of bias and confounding. But observational studies, as was already mentioned, may do better um, um, for instance, in relation to missing, they could, um, in, uh, for instance, in relation to um, core interventions that happen later um, um, in, a, uh, in the course of an observational and experimental um, intervention. So um, um, that, um, uh, um, an alternative to presenting grade 
um, would be that any body of evidence starts as high quality, that there would be five factors that lower the, the certainty or the quality of the evidence. Um, lack of randomization would usually lead to lowering um, the quality quite substantially, unless there are good reasons for believing that observational studies are not at risk of bias and confounding. Um, and then the other factors would just apply as I described them here. Um, it probably does um, some designs, some ran non-randomized designs, more justice, um, and um, uh, might bring this field together. At the end, um, the question was raised whether this can be done reliably. I put this slide in because I think there were concerns um, by Dean Fallman, for instance, or by Steve Goodman, sorry, uh, um, about whether or not people can assess evidence reliably. There is actually evidence, this is from, a, um, from Reem Mustafa's work, PhD student in the department, showing that reliability of these assessments of the quality can actually be quite good. So um, final clarification. Um, this applies, what I described here, applies to therapeutic questions. Um, different designs are obviously needed for prognostic um, studies and diagnostic accuracy research questions or different approaches to assessing the quality, but also there the great domains largely apply. So um, in conclusion, um, I do agree that research designs um, are initially flat, um, but that the certainty in the evidence um, or in the effects um, is not. Um, it is influenced by many designs beyond the risk of bias. Le um, lack of randomization is a big problem. Um, there is some um, reasons for increasing our certainty from observational studies that are primarily related to results um, or lack of, um, uh, sorry, lack of um, consistency, it should say. Um, and these are the same principles as in the 1970s. Not that much has actually changed. Thank you.